Let me say something to you. If you do not come into rest, you cannot move in the Spirit. It's as simple as that. You kind of clearly hear from God. And you know, in the day and age we, which we're living in, it's very hard to come into rest. Do you agree with me? Everything's wanting our attention. There's everything all around us. Face the giants. That's one of the giants you have to face is fear. You've got to overcome that giant. What if this is not of God? What if I'm being deceived? What does this mean to my ministry? If, if I'm a pastor, oh, will half my congregation leave? Where is this going to take me? You've got to kill that giant of fear. There are giants in the promised land, and you've got to take them out. And the promised land is on the inside. Take them out. You're going to face the giants. Oh, you are the land. Joshua said, we're well, well able to go in and take out those giants. That's our attitude. If God be with us, he can be against us. You were born for this in this generation. Don't mess it up now. The promised land. You see, in Hebrews 3, 8, it says, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Don't harden your hearts. When our fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works for 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart because they have not known my ways. And then he said this, I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Ah. Now he's talking about getting into the promised land and he said the promised land is a place of rest. Take heed, brethren, he said, lest there be any evil heart of unbelief. Coming into rest, he called the promised land a place of rest. How many of you know this is really hard? Particularly in this modern day and age. It's like we have everything. We've got TV, we've got music, we've got iPhones, we've got people texting. Never ends. I mean, my phone never stopped texting when I was here. I turned the thing off. It's like, what? You know, one thing that... Enoch said to me, he said, the kind of world you live in is different to the kind of world that I lived in, except we had to face different things. But he, he said, yours is a different world. And I said, and he said, you must do this. And I said, what? He said, at least one hour a day, you must shut everything down, shut all noise, music, everything else, and sit quiet for one hour each day. And I said, nah, and I said okay, um, it can go beyond that, of course, but this is a start, one hour. You're not thinking about anything. You're just quiet. You can do it outside, you can do it inside, but no distractions. And I said, why? He said, because you need to be reset every day. And I thought, wow. We get so hyped up. He said, you have to be reset every day in the quietness. And let your whole system come down. There remaineth a rest, you see, for the people of God. Rest. You see, the Feast of Tabernacles was held on the Sabbath, and it speaks of rest. And this rest is important because the, our minds are one of the last frontiers to be redeemed. One of the last frontiers is our mind to be redeemed. And I'll explain that a bit later, but, you know, so the promised land was called their resting place. It was, a, it was something they walked in a rest. It was different. Accessed by faith. Now, 
Paul, the Apostle Paul in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 9, he said this, There remaineth a rest to the people of God. Wow. And Paul wrote that about 50 years after the early church was birthed. In other words, they hadn't yet, even in the early church, entered into that kind of rest. Or he wouldn't be writing to them. He said, there remains a rest for you. And this was about 50 years later of the early church would come into existence. The early church, church, obviously not everyone entered into that rest. So why is that rest so important? See, in order for you to function in the realm of the spirit and in an open heaven, be conscious of the Lord walking with you daily, in you, through you, with you, alongside you, or next to you in the car, you have to be at rest. That's not being inefficient. It's a state of mind, rest. And you've got to work at that because, believe me, it's not easy. Uh, It's a last frontier, you know? And uh, you have to come into rest and peace. You know, one of the saints once said to me, he said, you know, he said, busyness will lead to barrenness. I thought, boy, yes, okay. <laughs> I write that in my diary. But it's true. You know, when Solomon dedicated the temple, you know, well, first it was on the Feast of Tabernacles. That's very significant. Because what happened in Solomon's temple is happened when we come into the Feast of Tabernacles in the new land. You see, we into this next phase, what happened in the feast of uh, on the Solomon's temple is going to unfold. See, we've all seen all that, you know, the glory of the Lord came down, yet yeah, did, but this was in the Feast of Tabernacles. It wasn't in Pentecost. It was on the Feast of Tabernacles. So, in Second Chronicles 5.13, it came to pass as the trumpets began and the singers were, were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising the Lord, thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with their trumpets and cymbals and instruments and music and all of that stuff, the house was filled. You are the house of the Lord. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, we need to understand that the glory filled the temple. The glory filled the temple. That's you, the house of the Lord. So the priests could not stand to minister because of reason of the glory cloud that filled the house. And it was on the first, on the Feast of Tabernacles, the promised land. Secondly, you are the temple. God wants to fill with glory. And that comes from your spirit in such a way that it emerges through your soul and and finally into your physical body, the glory of the Lord. So he fills the temple, the whole of the temple is filled with the glory of the Lord. And, uh, you know, rest, coming into rest, coming into peace. There were of one accord. Now, what does that mean? Well, I'm not sure if everybody was playing the same notes or what, but that was a, a picture. There were one of chord praising the Lord and so on. Let me just say that, you know, everything in God's word has seven levels. When your mind is in one accord with your spirit, you will ask what you will and it shall be done and the house will start to be filled with the glory of the Lord. You see, your, your spirit walks in another realm, different realm to you, your physical body, right? He, he doesn't live in time and space. He, he's, you know, he's spirit. Your inner man is spirit, lives in this different dimension where time and space does not exist, okay? But he is limited to your body. Now, when your mind and your spirit agree, the heavens open, a veil comes down, and a whole new realm opens up to you. But this is the problem where 
where the problem begins. That we're all in one accord, you see. Body, soul, and spirit have to be in one accord. Your soul has to come into rest, your mind, your emotions, and your will coming into rest, lining up with your spirit. Your spirit is connected to God, you see, and heaven, connected to God, heaven, the spirit realm, and is at rest. Now your soul has to come into that place. When your soul comes into rest in agreement with your spirit, your body will begin to be ta- start to be transformed. This is what came out of that scroll, you know, I took from. Your will start to be transformed. One accord, mind, emotions with your physical body. When your spirit and mind agree and they're in one accord, that's another level, you know, of the Word of God. There are two main veils that stop you from accessing the spiritual world realm. One is the veil of unbelief that shuts you out. There's a veil that shuts you out accessing that because it requires always. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So unbelief will shut down a veil in you. And the other veil that can shut you down is restlessness. You not haven't come into rest and peace. No matter what's happening around you. In this world we live in, it's crazy. You gotta come down a bit, chill out. Come into rest. It's still another day tomorrow. Peace. No matter what's happening around you. These are the giants in the land that you have to overcome. One of the giants in the land is your restlessness up here and your unbelief. You've got to kill that giant. And only you can do it. But you're well able. Joshua said, we're well able to do this. Come on. You know, it was the the veil of unbelief. It was what stopped Israel recognizing that Jesus was the Messiah. True. It says in 2 Corinthians 3.14, their minds were blinded until the day, this day remaineth a veil which is not, has never been taken away yet. And he's talking about the Jewish people. But it also talks about us today. The veil, in your reading of the Old Testament, this veil is done away with in Christ. But he said, but in, unto this day, when Moses read, the veil is still upon the hearts of the Jewish people. It is amazing that the scribes and Pharisees had been looking for the Messiah for hundreds of years, and when he turned up, they didn't recognize him. Unbelievable. Because it wasn't what they thought it should be like. And it said there was a veil across their mind of unbelief. And that veil of unbelief shuts us out from the spiritual realm. You know, you start moving in the spirit and you start thinking like this. Is this me? Is this real? Or am I just doing this? Doesn't matter if you're just doing it. At least you're trying. You'll get it right. God loves people who try and try hard and keep on trying. He loves them. But it says their minds were blinded even unto this day. And there remaineth the same veil that's untaken away. But that's true of us Christians too, you see. Unbelief. Now, in Isaiah 32 verse 17, it says, And the work of righteousness shall be peace. And the effect of this shall be quietness and assurance forever. So that's coming back down into this place of quietness, assurance, rest. You know, your mind, have you, you know what your mind's like. 
You start to pray and you think, well, I need to pray. And you, you pray for a while and suddenly your mind's way off somewhere else. <laughs> right? You, if you're like me, you know, your mind goes, <laughs> you got to pull it back in. <laughs> takes discipline. It takes practice. You know? Meditation is a good thing. It's not new age. Meditation is a good thing. You need to get quiet before the Lord and meditate on the Lord. Look unto Jesus. How do you look unto Jesus? He says, look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. How do you do that? You shut your eyes and see him in the mind's eye. And that which you focus on, you will connect with. That's a law of the spirit realm. You can do it. Now you say, oh, was that real? We all have that problem. We've all had that problem. Is it me? Well, there's no one else. It has to be you. <laughs> you know. But it should be you doing the right thing. So you move into that realm. Your focus. That was one of the first principles the Lord taught me. What you focus on, you will connect with good or bad. All right. So the battle is in the mind. There are veils, unbelief. The work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of that shall be quietness and assurance forever. So you go through a day, and your mind is being everywhere, and you're busy, you're at work, you're doing these things, Come home, put some time aside, and be quiet, and get a reset. You know how you get a reset in your computer? Well, get a reset up here. Don't do anything. Don't go think of anything. Just be quiet. If music helps you with that, then be very careful. That's the right kind of music and very low, 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 low key. Music you can carry you. It has a, has a power to carry you into places. So you have to be careful with it. But if you can just be quiet, close down, shut down, just be quiet. You don't have to pray. Just be quiet. Reset. And if you, it's easier if you do that every day than you let it go for months and months, you know, when this whole thing builds up within you. So the battle is in the, in, in the areas of mind. So in quiet resting places, this is you. That's where we have to live. We have to come into rest. You say, well, things are going wrong. Okay. The Lord is with you, right? He's in you, is he? Okay, things are going wrong. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. He's in control because you deliberately put him in control. <laughs> and say, Lord, I, this is something I can't handle, I can't deal with. It's all yours. And he'll give you answers. You've got to stop, surrender. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Reset. You know? And it, it's, it's like something you have to do in this world we're living in now. You know, when it comes to our soul, an everyday requirement, you know, we ha need to keep the slate clean in our lives, right? Before the Lord. We need to keep things clean be in, in before the Lord. But, you know, there's a daily thing. Your mind, your emotions, your imagination, your memory, you know. And it was like Jesus wanted to wash Peter's feet. Remember that? And Peter said, no, you're not going to do that. Oh, you're not going to wash my feet, you know. Thou shalt never wash my feet, John 13, 8. And um, Jesus said, okay, but if I wash not your feet, you have no part in me. Wow. That's a bit tough. John 13, 9. Simon Peter said to him, Okay, Lord, not my feet only, but wash my hands and wash my head. <laughs> no, Peter was like that. <laughs> Jesus said to him, Whoa, no. He that washed does need not save to wash his feet. Just 
let me wash your feet and you'll be clean all over. And I thought, okay, what's that about? You know, what is that about? Well, our feet is a picture of the part of us that touches this earth. Our feet are on the earth. You know, when you go through a day, there's all kinds of stuff hits your mind, your eyes, that can pollute, you know? We've got to be honest with this. You see something, you hear something, you think something which you shouldn't be thinking, and all this pollution, you imagine something you shouldn't be imagining, and then it sticks in our memory banks and can be replayed. So you get to the end of the day, you've gone through this world which is in chaos, you walk down the road, come on you guys, and you see a, a clad, the scantily clad woman, your eyes is hit her because you don't know what's coming around the corner, but the image goes there. Come on, you guys, you know what I'm talking about. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> it's there. And it's gone into your memory banks. At the end of the day, he said, your feet, you've touched the earth. You just need to wash, wash it out. He said, let me wash it out of you. It's nothing you do with your heart. This is the world we touch. And it's like, okay, um, it's a, we must daily do this. Come to the Lord and say, Lord, this is what I do anyway. I say, Lord, I want you first of all to cleanse my mind. Cleanse my memories that are not right in your mind and heart. I don't want those memories. Cleanse my imagination. Remove everything that's ungodly or not of you. Cleanse. Cleanse my mouth. If I've spoken things I shouldn't have. And purify my heart. If my motives are not right, I'm sorry. Purify my heart. You must do that every day. It's like the Lord washing your feet. You've gone through a day and you've picked up the pollution. You see, Jesus and Peter said, oh no, you wash all. And he said, you don't need to be washed everywhere. Just the parts that touch the earth. It's, but you've gone through this day and it clings to you. You know what I mean? It just clings to you. So, you say, oh, okay. You've got to do that daily. Cleanse your mind, your memories, your imagination. And so, that's part of the process. Cleanse your heart, your brain cells. And rest in the foundation. You know, true rest and peace is found in un finding out, it comes by knowing what God is really like. One, he said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Secondly, he never stops loving you. You can be, no matter what situation you find yourself in, God doesn't stop loving you. He is good. God is good. God is good. He is kind. And he's with you. You need to know, no matter what you're going through, that God is good, he knows what's going on, and he is with you. Amen. And so peace can come. You can be settled in that. We might not, you might not know the future, how this thing's going to turn out, but God is in control, because you put him in control. You have to do these things. And they have to be, you know, daily things. You know, Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for them who love God. Most Christians don't believe that. Or they do. They say, oh, yes, I believe that. But they don't really, because when things go wrong, they don't believe it anymore. <laughs> All things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purposes. You say, well, why do bad things happen to good people? And they do. Where's God in that? 
Well, you have to come back to the, be- the baseline. God is good. He knows what you're going through. These things have happened. But in the end, you will see there is a redemptive purpose in it all. It's important that daily in our lives, we set a pattern according to his word and what he wants for us. We take communion. We take time to be quiet. We ask him to cleanse us every day, particularly your mind and your imagination. Stuff enters through the eyes and you can't stop it all. It's just there in front of you. So it enters, enters through your eyes and through your ear and it enters into memory and it enters in, as it's received as a memory and a picture and sometimes a sound. And then it's there. You know, have you ever had sometimes you smell something and it brings back a memory? What is that? The memory triggered the, the visual image. And that all stores up here. Clouds you out of the... And you say, Lord, every day cleanse my mind, my imagination. Cleanse my memory cells. Cleanse, cleanse. Wash, it's like your feet. Jesus washing your feet so that you, you start your day clean again. You don't have to clean your spirit. You're born again, but it clings to us, you know, on the outside. Another thing Enoch said to me, he said, Christians are walking in the wrong order. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you walk in body, soul, and spirit. He said, you must reverse this order that most Christians exist in. That is the body, the soul, and the spirit. This is not the order that man was created to walk in. I thought, okay, yeah, I, know, I think I know that, yeah, I've, yeah. I think I've even preached on that. And he looked at me and said, yeah, but you didn't get it all. I thought, all right. <laughs> you must reverse the order to spirit, soul, and body. Amen. Now, how do you do that? You must wear your spirit. You know, essentially, you are a spirit. Now, how many of you have thought today about your spirit? See? You all look guilty. How many of you have thought about your spirit today? He's a real person. He's more real than your physical person, you know. He's filled with light and color, power, filled with the seed and the DNA of God. That's who you really are. But we neglect him. We ignore him. You've got to start wearing him on the outside. In other words, let God arise within us. God in your spirit. And the enemies in our soul and body be scattered. To rising within us. So I said, okay. I said, what more do you have to say about this? He said, well, awareness will will determine the order. I thought, yeah, I know that. You must use awareness to reverse the order. He said, seeing oneself in the right order, if you do this, it will eventually become permanent. You hear what I'm saying? Now this is extra biblical because it's off a scroll and stuff and it's Enoch talking to me, but it's not unbiblical, right? There's a difference. It's extra biblical, but it's not unbiblical because the Bible talks about this in the New Testament, you know? And so we're told to walk in the spirit over and over and over and over again, but we're not told how to do it, see? Then he said something, he said this to me. What you see as the order will eventually become the order. It's a matter of what you are consciously aware of. I thought, yeah, 
I know that I almost at this point dipped into quantum physics, but I held myself back. <laughs> Why did God give you imagination? Well, it's obvious, so you can imagine. <laughs> Why did he give you this incredible thing of imagination? Because we all have it. You know? How many of you know that Jesus considered imagination as real? Now, there's a scary thought of but I decided to touch on that this morning. He said, you know, he talked about the woman, the lusting after a woman. He said, you've already done it. It's real. In the spirit realm, it's real. And that realm is more real than this realm. So you'll have imagination. It can be used for good, bad, or it can be just blank. You use your imagination. You know, the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the faith. How do you do that? Well, you use your imagination and you look at him. That's what you're giving imagination for, to access the other realm. The imagination is a bridge between the soul and the spirit. Amen. And you journey across it in your imagination. Beholding the Lord, we are changed into the same image. Right? How do you behold the Lord? You use your imagination. Let me just say something to you. You know when we are worshiping, singing, worshiping, if you get your imagination into action so that what you're singing, you are seeing as real, it is real. It's going to transform the way we worship. You're given this faculty to connect with the unseen realm, the eyes of the heart. And as you're worshiping God, tell them who he is in worship, you need to use your imagination to be there, yes. to see him, to be there. You get a whole congregation worshiping the Lord like that, the atmosphere is going to change really quick. And so, he said, if you need to see your spirit as being larger than your physical body. Now, you know, you can't, it's like, after a while, after you practice, as you focus on the Lord, this is part of focusing on the Lord, as you focus on the Lord, or you focus on your spirit of being larger than your body, let God arise, and our enemies be scattered within us. So you're looking at the Lord, you're looking unto Jesus, do you see him? You say, ah, oh, it's just my imagination. <sighs> Why did God give your imagination? so you could connect with him in the other realm. That's how you connect. Beholding the Lord, we changed into the same image. From glory, one level of glory to another. Awareness, he said, will determine the order. You must use awareness or your imagination to reverse the order. You've got to start wearing your spirit. Let your spirit be enlarged. If you continue to do this, you will create a permanent right order. You'll be more aware of your spirit than you are of your physical body. The order will be a re a reverse, you see, through awareness. Hmm. Awareness creates connection. Imagination creates a connection. That's why God gave it to you. The Bible talks about imagination quite a, quite a bit now, you, you know, about connecting with God this way. You've got to learn. There's something you have to do. It's not going to just happen something you have to do. Connect with the Lord. If you start connecting with the Lord, suddenly you'll start beginning to see other things like angels in your room. 
I'm with you, he said. I'm always there. Reversing the order. Awareness creates a connection and brings about, listen to me, a reality. The law of the spirit of life sets you free from the law of sin and death. What is the law of the spirit of life? Connection. It's connection. That's the law. It is, this is a law. Like gravity is a law. The law of the spirit of life. You're going to be full of the spirit of life. You've got to see your spirit filled with God and filled with light and filled with color. A magnificent being. Because that's who you are. You know, some churches, preachers and some Pentecostal churches, they really think you're nuts. Do you know what? I don't care. We've come too far now to go back. If you want to go on, we can tell you a little bit on how to go on. But you have to do most of the work. Awareness creates a connection. This in turn, and Enoch said to me, this in turn will increase the reality of the armor of light light that clothes you. Amen. I thought, oh, that makes sense. Yeah. But you're full of light and if that's now coming through on the outside. Discipline, you see, is required. Discipline. Now he said this to me. Do we still got some time? Yeah, okay. He said this to me. He said, no, he said, you often see the Lord on the external to you. I said, yes, most days. And usually when I'm preaching, the Lord will stand next to me because I'll put him there. I'll see him there. David said, I put the Lord at my right hand when I go into battle. How did he do that? And that scripture is repeated in the New Testament, in Acts, the book of Acts. And so it's like, he said, seeing the Lord in you, external to you, is stage one. He said, but seeing the Lord in you, looking out through you, is stage two. There's a difference, you know. You can see him in there or you can see him here. And, um, and I thought, oh, okay. Okay. 